and start recording. Hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thanks so much for joining today. We'll let everybody just get a second to get settled, but let me do a quick intro as we, as you get acquainted and as we get ready to start today's session. My name is Celine Prezan, and I am a community marketing manager here at Memory Fox, the platform to help you tell great stories, not only build them, but also collect them from your community and share them. We have are joined by today a remarkable, wonderful, fantastic partner of ours, Sabrina Walker Hernandez. And Sabrina is not only the president and CEO of Supporting World Hope, but she's really just a certified consultant, coach, facilitator, and just expert storyteller. She um, is gracious enough to be spending some time with us today to really dig into storytelling, her best practices, and a little bit more about her background. Sabrina served as the executive chief executive officer for Boys and Girls Club um, of Edinburgh, where she successfully completed a $12 million comprehensive capital campaign, established a 500K endowment, and had just a really remarkable sizable cash reserves. Sabrina and I have connected um, previously in the past on, on our podcast, and she just is an all around joy. And I can't wait for you guys to get some time with her, as well as not to just learn from her but be able to ask her questions directly one-on-one. -on -one. So she's been gracious enough to give our community, our Memory Facts community, that opportunity. So with that said, Sabrina, I'm going to stop sharing and allow you to do a quick intro of yourself um, and just get ready and get set up. So guys, I am going to ask for grace as I share my screen um, because I always somehow manage to do it wrong. So um let let me make sure you see what I see and we're going to do this. Hopefully you see the cover and everything's good. Perfect. That's a, I'm, I'm telling you it's the first time that's happened. So is this, a, this is a good thing. This is a good thing. So welcome to, uh, to this facilitation. Guys, we're going to be talking about the keys to nonprofit storytelling. Um, I'm so very happy to, to be here. Thank you for your time. I know you could be spending your time anywhere else, but you chose to spend your time here with us today and invest. So a little bit about me. I studied political science and public administration. I obtained a nonprofit uh, management certification from Harvard Business School. Again, I'm a certified consulting coach facilitator, best-selling author who helps nonprofits and small businesses build relationships that increase revenue. I've been in the nonprofit industry for 25 years. And as mentioned, completed a capital campaign, had a reserve, took my organization's budget from $750,000 to 2.5 million. And the part that's not really told is it was in the third poorest county in the United States. Now, I want you to look at these pictures because you can see from these pictures, you would think I'm an adventurous soul because I've done these things. Jumped out of airplanes, uh, repelled, uh, did hiking. This is just all snapshots and moments. It's a lie, but I'm telling stories. These are the times that I stepped outside of my comfort zone and it was a great reward. So as we're going through this presentation, Remember, for some of you, this may be a moment where you're stepping outside of your comfort zone, and it is okay to do that. Um, it is okay. I have done it at least, you know, on three occasions, and I have these great memories and photos to account for it. And so what do I do? I do training webinars. I do workshops. I'm a keynote speaker. Um, I do leadership board and strategic planning retreats, executive and fundraising coaching and consulting. Um, but I started my company, believe it or not, Supporting World's Hope um, in 2018, 2019. I got diagnosed with cancer and I got diagnosed with lymphoma and multiple myeloma. And from the hospital bed at the stem cell transplant, I launched my company, Supporting World Hope. Why do I tell people that story? I tell people that story because I know what it's like to be a overworked, stressed out, overwhelmed, 
nonprofit professionals. And I started my company with the mission of helping nonprofit professionals who are in that situation. And because that is the mission of my company, a lot of the services that I provide are low cost or no cost. And I only partner with companies that want to help you. And that's why I'm so happy to be a partner with the Memory Fox because they get it. They want to provide support, help it, help like help make life easier for you to share your stories. And so that's just a little bit about me. Who will benefit from this webinar? If you're a nonprofit CEO or development staff, you're going to benefit from this webinar. Um, if you're wanting to uh, learn about storytelling and use it for fundraising, if you're a board member. Um, and want to use storytelling uh, for fundraising, or anyone really just wanting to enhance their fundraising experience, this webinar is for you. And the goal of this webinar is to provide tips on sharing your nonprofit story, explore how to use storytelling as a fundraising tool, explore how to build an emotional connection with your audience, and to gain insight on how to develop a plan for using storytelling within your nonprofit work. Because we can talk about this all day long, but if you don't have a plan and you, you will not execute that plan. So hopefully as we go through this, um, you will have some questions and we're gonna do questions at the end to put them in the chat. Hopefully as we go through this, this information will resonate and it will be helpful to you and if there is something that I don't get to and you have a specific uh, question around, we will, we will try to answer that. So basically, what are the elements of storytelling? So I want to make it as simple as possible. Don't get complicated. Don't. I'm, I'm all about simplicity. Remember, you're oftentimes stressed out and overwhelmed. So if I can give you steps, that's what I'm going to do. So there's a four-step formula to storytelling. Step one, we, we see it in the movies all the time. There's a main character that is introduced. So introduce the main character. Step two, a problem arises in the character's life. Step three, your organization or donor helps the character overcome the problem. I say, have it be the donor. We always try to make the donor, put the focus on the do donor and have the donor be the hero. And we'll talk about that throughout this. And then number four is you invite your audience to help others who are faced with a similar problem. And if you use this framework over and over and over again, when you're crafting your nonprofit story, it is going to help you make the, the connections that you need to make with your donors. And so there's some things that really needs to be in place. So let's see this in uh, practice. I'm gonna share the story uh, with you and we're gonna talk about it and we're gonna go over it. So Jack is currently in intensive care and I have been told he's going to die. I don't want him to die in the hospital surrounded by machinery. I want Jack to have a nice, clean, shiny hair when he dies. I want to cuddle Jack in his Mr. Man duvet when he dies. I want the last thing he hears to be my voice reading Mr. Bump, his favorite bedtime story when he does. This would not happen in a hospital. So I chose to take Jack to Claire's house. At Claire's house, Nurse Ruth helped me to wash Jack's hair with his own shampoo, so he smelled like Jack. Heather put Jack's Mr. Man duvet on, so he felt, so it felt like Jack's bed. And I cuddled Jack in his bed, reading Mr. Bump, and I kissed Jack one last time before he died peacefully in my arm. Claire's house helped me do this. We couldn't stop Jack from dying, but with your donation, 
Claire's House can support moms like Helen to choose where Jack died and create memories that will last a lifetime. So let's break this, let's break the story up. What happened as you listened to this story? You know who the character is. You know what the conflict is. You have a mom whose child is dying. She knows he's dying. There is no way around that. But she doesn't want her child. The problem is she doesn't want her child to die in this hospital. She wants her child to have a peaceful passing. She wants her child to smell like her child. She wants to have a normal night with her child. And she credits Claire's house and the donor for making that possible. And she invites you in to help others who are in that situation. It's four steps. The main character, what their problem, what the problem, how can be solved, right? And then how you can join them in so and helping others sim with those similar problems. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking it's a dying child. Who wouldn't help a dying child, right? I, I for 20 plus years worked in with youth. And I tell you, people always tell me, well, people give to animals and, and kids. You would be surprised <laughs> the challenge that people who uh, work with animals and kids have in telling their story, right? And fundraising. It's with any cause that you have to come up with that story that connects with people emotionally. And I know that a story about a dying child is extreme and it's you, you're going to connect with that emotionally. But here's another one that I wanna give you. My child is struggling with depression. I don't know how to help him. Juan is my outgoing 16 year old son who loves being involved in the community and after school activities. Juan, because of COVID-19 has been unable to participate in the drama club, band and all his other after school activities. He even lost his part-time job. I want Juan to feel unstuck. I want Juan not to be like one of the 18 teens who have committed suicide across the Rio Grande Valley during this pandemic. I want Juan to be my happy yet hormonal teen again. This would not happen if Juan stays home, locked away in his room. So I chose to take Juan to the Boys and Girls Clubs of Edinburgh, Rio Grande Valley. At the club, teen staff Nick helps Juan to be a part of the community. Social worker Carmen works with Juan to help him address the feelings of stress, confusion, fear, and doubt that and the doubt that seems insurmountable. And program staff Sarah teaches Juan that he has the power to choose. Boys and Girls Clubs of Edinburgh, RGV helped me empower my son and let him know he is not alone. So those are two very different examples of stories, but they all do the same thing. Main character, problem, credit organization, a donor help solving a problem and then inviting you in um, to help with that. So when you tell a story, you have to create empathy. You have to be able to identify and create that empathy for a human being. So you have to establish the context. And those stories, we know the context. One is a terminally ill child. Another one is a teen that's been impacted by the pandemic. What is the, for your mission, what, what empathy are you trying to create? What context are you establishing this in? 
you have to develop an emotional connection. And the donor has to see your client as a person or a living being. If you happen to be animal, um, a shelter or animal service, they need to identify with that. You have to provide understanding of the data. And in the first story with Claire's house, we didn't mention data at all. It was not mentioned as far as numbers. But our assumption is that this organization provides this care for any terminal ill child. And as you're listening to that story, you don't think, well, is that one child? It really is about Jack. You don't think, well, is it only 25 a year? Is it only 30 a year? Those are not the questions that come up in your head when you hear the story. And so what you're trying to do is give donors something that they can hold on to. Especially when you're, if it's a terminal ill child, you think, okay, the child is gone. What can the donor hold on to? The donor in that case holds on to a mother who got the right to, to choose how her child would exit this earth, the dignity in that process. So you have to give the donor something to hold on to. And I want you to remember the framework when you're crafting your stories for your organization, for your clients that you serve. And I know, again, I'm going to be right up front. I got to live in that Boys and Girls Club world where we could tell stories about kids every day and to be able to collect those stories. So I get the, I get the advantage that I had. But I am going to challenge you that every organization has a story that they can share. I often get the pushback from organizations that perhaps um, provide services to uh, clients that with confidential, you know, confidentiality becomes an issue, right? And I always tell these clients, you have to tell that story from a different perspective. So for example, I had a, a client that is um, worked with, they call them unhoused or, or homeless people. Well, yeah, you don't, you, you often worry about, I don't want to exploit my, my clients. That's not something that we want to do. So I always say, again, tell that story from a different perspective. So we crafted stories around the movie, the box. As if you are unhoused person, oftentimes you may be living in a box. That's the image that we come up with under a bridge or a tent, you know, we, we framed it from that box and their mission was to take people from being homeless to getting them to be housed, to get them from unhoused to housed. And so we told the story from that box, being a home to that client now using that box to move into their home. So you just have to get really creative in how you tell that story when you're dealing with confidentiality information. If you are a battered, uh, a, a battered spouse shelter, tell the story from the bag that's packed, that's in the closet, right? That bag that's been sitting there, it's packed, it's there waiting for when you get the courage to leave. And you talk about that transition of that bag. So you don't have to, Put the focus on the person when you're dealing with those confidentiality. You can tell that story from the perspective of an inanimate object, but still get into the emotional state of the person. So I wanted to remove that barrier for those who, who deal with those sensitive, um, sensitive issues and tell you how to tell that story. And so stories matter. Stories have more impact on listeners than any kind of data. And again, in the first story, we didn't share any numbers at all, but you will remember the story because stories matter. We are in a culture and a world where knowledge is passed down through stories, through family stories, through um, cultural stories. We are a storytelling 
world. And the more that you can get your stories out there, the better it will be for you in fundraising. And I'm not just saying this. I will share with you some data as we get into this and how we reframed our organization and how the, the stories impacted our budget. But stories, we want to make our donors feel good. Now you say, how would a dying child make your donor feel good? It makes them feel good because again, that child got to leave with dignity, not surrounded by machinery. You got to give that mom closure. Those are the things that you have to make sure that you connect with. It shows the donors um, that your organization or your service that you provide makes a difference. It creates urgency. Children are dying. Kids are committing suicide. These are things that create urgencies. It has a call to action. And it, and it keeps you um, from being dry if you tell a story and worse yet, being boring. There is nothing like being boring. If you tell boring stories, no one's gonna remember your organization. And so you have to put some thought into what is your story? What are those organizational stories that you're gonna go out and share with the community? What are those stories that you're gonna go out and share with your board? And I'll tell you how you, you'll be able to do that. But again, let's go back to the money. Stories equal money. There is the state of the story um, telling and nonprofit sector report that shows that um, when asked, like stories really impact your fundraising results. 32% says somewhat improves. And I want you to say, I put that 32% because somewhat improve for many small organizations will make a difference. 24% says it definitely improved their fundraising. 28% is unsure and 16% says no, no change. But if I take that 32% and that 24%, that is a high percentage. And I'm telling you, when we focus our organization in on stories and identifying kids' stories and telling those stories, whether we were at a, a gala event, where whether we spoke at a civic club or rotary club, um, whether we... Um, held a golf tournament, it would, it always went back to the kids' stories. What are their stories? And oftentimes we had them tell their own story. So anytime you can get your clients in front of your donors to tell their stories firsthand, it's going to make a difference. And if you can't get them in front of them to tell their stories firsthand, recordings of those stories. All of these things are going to make a impact and it's gonna equal money. I get asked all the time, how did you take your budget from $750,000 to $2.5 million in the third poorest county in the United States? And I'm going to tell you that stories made a huge difference in this process. When I started, I had zero individual giving zero. Can we all say zero in the back room? There was no individual giving in the organization. When we implemented storytelling and start telling these stories to our donors and putting it out there, within the first year, our budget went from zero to $250,000 from individuals by telling these stories. And every year, we got better at telling our story. So you have to tell your client's story. You are, there, you are their voice. If I can't stress anything for to you, you are their voice. And when you are out telling their story, you honor their story. You share their story. Because people want to help. And so an effective story is gonna be universal. It doesn't have to be this huge exceptional story. It needs to be universal. Why does it need to be universal? Because people need to identify. They need to be able to identify 
with your client. Identify with the character in that story. And I have a, a, a friend who says, you know, one of my clients, you know, climbs Mount Everest. And it's a great story to tell, right? Great story. But how many of us have ever climbed Mount Everest? Or how many of us, we, we haven't done that. So that story needs to be universal. It needs to be, a, it's okay to have a universal common story. It's okay to have kids who perhaps, um, you know, need help to do their homework after school. Those are those stories are okay. You don't need to have these huge stories that you think, oh, this one is really going to resonate with the donor. It just it needs to be universal. It needs to be memorable. You need to have several stories, have some variety. It needs to involve the donor as a hero because storytelling is the ultimate weapon. And you need to have a variety of stories. You can't go around saying the same client story over and over again. And you have to have a variety of stories because 60%, 60, 60 of fundraising is building relationships. And so by the time you get in front of a donor, you should know what story resonates with them. You should know that Sabrina is the, my donor. We built a relationship. I know Sabrina is very passionate about education. So I am going to tell her the story about Sandra who dropped out of school and we were able to get her back into school. And now Sandra works for Dale Company as a engineer. Those are the stories that you need to tell. But you need to tell stories that resonates with the donor. And the only way you're going to know what stories resonate with your donor is to build a relationship with your donor and have those stories and collect those stories. So storytelling is, a, is the ultimate weapon. Because people, again, our culture, everyone identifies with stories. So like I said, you have to adapt um, your stories to your donors to make the most impact. Because what resonates with me will not resonate with the next person. So you can't have a canned story, that same canned story that you tell every time. You got to have some variety. That's where the work comes in, okay? You got to be able to tell a great story. And so if you are a staff person that's in charge of this, a board member that's in charge of the how, or a CEO that's in charge of this, because oftentimes, like I said, we, we are generally understaffed. And I know about being understaffed. Um, and if you have a RD staff, it's a resource development staff, which I did not have for the first 15 years. And remember, I was only in this position for 20. So my last five years, I had finally a resource development person. But if you happen to have a resource development person, or if you're the CEO doing the resource development, you should spend time with the client and staff to collect stories on top of everything else that you do. But that's gonna be one of the most critical uses of your time is spending time with clients. And I'm not talking about a lot of time. I will tell you, again, I was from a small organization. You have the history of my organization. Um, and when we did our capital campaign, we did a $12 million capital campaign. I made sure that my office was in the building where we provided service to the kids. I did not want to have a separate administrative office away from, from the kids. Why did I do that? I understood that storytelling and having a relationship with the kids was very critical to our fundraising goal. And so my office was, they kids have to pass by my office to get to the program area, get to the cafeteria, any of that. Why? I wanted them to be able to stop in, to say hello, to share with me how their day went um, so I can ask questions so that I can get to know them. 
so that I could gather stories because they tell their stories. I also, maybe once a year, not a lot, but at least once a year, did a program. I know, I know. I probably am contradicting things that you've heard. But yes, as a, a CEO of my organization, I ran a program once a year because I could, my nurse couldn't take it any more than that. But I worked with a group of uh, six kids and we would plant a garden once a year. And during that time, I would have conversations with them. I would learn about their story. I would take notes on who they were. What were their family situations? What were, you know, why did they come to the after school program? Uh, all of those things. So I could firsthand have those stories that I could share. And we also put systems in place where the staff collect stories and shared those stories um, with, with our development team. And the other thing that we did, and I want you, if you take nothing else from this, from your board to participate in storytelling, start your board meetings off with mission moments. That is how you're going to get your board members involved in fundraising and storytelling. It takes less than five minutes of your agenda. Start your board meetings off with mission moments. So what is a mission moment? A mission moment is when your client comes in at the top of the meeting and they share something about themselves. There's some interaction going on. So we would have a club kid come in and they would come in and they would say, this is my name. This is the school that I go to. This is why I come to the after school program. Board members will ask them questions. They are answer the questions and board members retain those stories about that child. And that was 11 stories that they had that they could use throughout the year when they were at their um, company mixers or at the chamber meeting or at the Rotary Club meeting, whatever those were. And for those of you saying, well, I don't service cute kids. You don't have to service cute kids. Again, I serve on a historical museum board. And every time I go to my board meeting, there is a new exhibit in the boardroom. And we get 15 minutes before the board meeting to, to talk to a fellow board members, to walk the exhibit, to ask questions, to gain knowledge, to remind us of why we're there. And another genius one that I saw was um, a zoo. What they would do before their a meeting for their mission moment is they would bring in an animal. And so they brought in a snake. This is the one that I remember. I don't like snakes. Well, I got better understanding of snakes now, but I still, they ain't my favorite, right? But I know they're not slimy to touch. I know that they're not all poisonous. They got some good things about them, but that's what I learned during the mission moment. So it can be an animal that you can bring in. It could be, again, it could be a child. It could be well, whoever your client is. And if your client can't be there again because of confidentiality, then tell the story from a different perspective. These are all things that you can do because at the end of the day, you're equipping, you're equipping your board with stories. And we've already said that stories is the strongest data point. Stories can make that connection. Stories can get people to give. And so that's what you're trying to do. So keep that in mind. You need to measure the impact of your stories. Have a starting point. Again, for me, it was, we started out with zero, <laughs> zero and I individual giving, and we grew our individual giving from zero to $240,000. That's a huge measurement. And use short videos to tell stories. Use short videos to tell stories. I said again and again, remember the donor. It's about the donor. It's not about your organization. It's about the donor and how that donor has made an impact on your client. And then incorporate storytelling in your resource development plan. How do you do that? Um, again, I'll recap this one. 
in your resource development plan, you make it about your client. So again, I'll say this, if it's a special event, make sure you have an opportunity to highlight a client. We had a, a gala. So at that gala, our kids got up and they told their stories. The centerpieces on the table were made by the kids. Um, the, the takeaway that the sponsors got was artwork designed by the kids. It's always putting your mission in front of them and always having a story and having those kids or clients get up and share their story. So I work with the animal shelter at their special event. What do they do as adoption? They bring in puppies and cats and they allow people to adopt right then and there. Here are some of the animals that we had at a black tie gala event. Here are some of the animals that we have. They take them around from table to table. You have to tell their story. It's an honor to tell their story and you have to put their story right there in front of the donor again and again and again. You cannot be shy about telling this story over and over again. And I was talking to someone this morning and it takes, we used to say it takes seven times for you to say something for people to, for it to sink in. Now with uh, social media and all of this, we figured out it's about nine times. So yes, you're gonna have a variety of stories that you're gonna tell, but you may find yourself telling that same story over and over and over again. And it's gonna sound mundane to you, but to others, it is not. Because this might be their eighth time hearing it and the ninth time it might kick in. So keep telling the stories. And there's a checklist, um, there's a storytelling checklist that I like to share with you just so you get some idea because I love, I don't like webinars that don't, where well, you don't walk away with something concrete, right? And so again, the foundation of storytelling, try to make it about an actual person um, or actual animal using their name, their age, some descriptive words that paints a picture to your listener. Count the number of words that emotionally connect the listener to your work and the person you're speaking about. Use a minimum of five descriptive words in any story, whether it's a verbal story or a written story. Eliminate any jargon. Don't talk about you know, residential housing or advocacy or youth development. See, I, I was youth development. I never mentioned the word youth development. I do talk about club kids a lot. <laughs> Don't talk about achievement gaps. This is not this is not language that resonates with your donor. This is our industry jargon, and nobody nobody else knows really what it means, right? Um, share up to three specific examples of your work, and be specific 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 about how my southern's coming out about how your staff program event or volunteer makes a difference in the life of a real person. And I even put the example here again, it's after school, that's my background, after school program um, to help kids with homework, stay safe and be uh, surrounded by young adults who listen and help kids learn how to make smart choices. And when telling the story, you gotta keep it tight. Two minutes or less, and I know that's hard for some people, but you gotta keep it tight. Those stories that I told you about Jack and about Juan, they were all done in two minutes or less. And they made an impact. I know those stories made an impact because the first time I heard Jack's story, it made an impact on me. And the first time I heard Juan's story, it made an impact on me. And they were two minutes or less. And those stories can become your elevator pictures. And that's how can you communicate with uh, someone about what you do um, going from floor one to floor two in an elevator, two minutes or less, very impactful. And if you want some advanced techniques, here it is uh, for your storytelling checklist. Remember the foundation, so that doesn't go away. These are in addition to the foundation. You can also include, for my data people, you can also include a cost per day 
uh, per week or month for the program or for the person that you're talking about. Um, don't ask for contributions while you're sharing your story. Remember, the call to action is not really, it's not a specific ask. And you need to make sure that your story infers that there's more to be done. You know, if there's a waiting list or you're turning people away or communities or school or schools are waiting for your, for your program. All the, the stories that you heard today, Jack story one today, stories, you know that there are other terminal kids out there that need service. You know that there are other teens out there that needs that service. So you're inferring that. It doesn't, you don't have to explicitly state it, you can, but it can also be inferred. And um, you share your funding gap in your story. If you are seeking additional gifts, you can share the funding gap. What is left to be uh, raised from your fund development efforts um, through your year end or fiscal year end? You're not asking for money, but you can explicitly say we have this funding gap. And at the end of the day, if you still feel nervous, you can practice. If you feel uncomfortable with the money story um, that you're including in the people story, practice. And after 25 years, 20, 25 years in the industry, guys, I still get nervous when it comes to the, the money question. But this is what I tell myself. I am not asking for uh, money for Sabrina, right? I am asking for money uh, on the behalf of the kids that I serve who don't have a voice. They need this service and I'm doing this on their behalf. Those are kind of the little mantras I would tell myself. Um, so anything that helps get you through that because at the, a lot of times um, if you build the relationship right with 60% of fundraising, is relationships, then that ask is just, it's a natural process. But if you're not investing that 60% in building relationships, you're gonna be more nervous, right? But at the same time, remember that you're not asking for yourself. You're asking on behalf of the clients that you serve. You're asking on behalf of the child that you serve, on the animal that you serve, on the abused spouse that you serve. Um, that's who you're asking for on the, the unhoused person that you serve, on that hungry family. That's who you're asking for. And so at, at the end of the day, you need to make sure you cover all the basics of story structure and just to get you started, here's the beginning of six sentences that can help you with the process. We all know this one. Once upon a time in a land not far, far away. That that's a that we all have heard that. That starts the story off and introduces the, the protagonist. Or um, and every day. And every day Juan comes to this, um, and every day he sits in his room. Um, these are these are great sentence stars because this was set up how life was before the challenge or the um, inciting incident. And then until one day, every day I struggled, every day I felt alone until one day I was introduced to Miss Joe. That begins the action of the story with, a ch uh, with the challenging goal. And then, and because of this, this introduces the barriers or obstacles to the, that the protagonist faces. And because of this, until finally, that's what ends the story. So once upon a time and in every day until one day and because of this and because of this until finally, that ends the story with the resolution. And if you do that, you are a storyteller. So there's 20 places to share your story at nonprofit events. Once you, you know, equip your board with stories, the mission moments, once you equip yourself as an RD person or a CEO 
with the stories. Now you just got to shout them from the top of the, from the rafters. And where is it that you're going to share these stories? Here's 20 places. You're going to share stories on invitations and save the date cards. You're going to share them on table tents. What did I tell you? At our event, we had kids stories on right front and center, table tents, on um, program inserts, um, short story videos, um, that you can send via email, that you can post up on social media, put them on Facebook, on Pinterest, on Twitter, on websites, um, at event kickoffs for volunteers, you know, videos, you can put them live or print it. Remember what I said, you know, we were always, any given opportunity, we would have our kids come in and share their own stories. So that's live. And if they couldn't, we recorded them. Um, and reminder emails, uh, again, on your website, on your homepage, um, on your donation page, on your program page, at your golf events, uh, at whole signs, live testimonials, bathrooms, elevators, stairs, wherever um, you can have uh, your client's stories there. You can have everyone share their story. You can have it on t-shirts with their photos and, and quotes, um, banners and other signage uh, at a, at a, at a thankathon or a telethon or a gift bag. Take photos of your clients and have their testimonials. Um, have them speak at different events. All of these things are, are possible. And then after an event, have them with a thank you video sent via email. I say sent via text. I found that my donors really like that. A lot of people, like I say, emails make me nervous. I don't even know if I said that, but I'm telling you now, emails make me nervous. I get like, uh, like a things to do list. So I appreciate text and I would send my donors uh, videos uh, via text um, of kids that say, you know, thank you. Um, and it's one child, if I can be very clear, one child, not a group of kids um, saying thank you. And sometimes that can be overwhelming for people. You want your donor to associate with that one child that I help that one child. Because a lot of times when we throw a huge picture or video with a lot of people, donors are like, I can't help all those people or I don't believe what I gave helped all those people. You have to be realistic too. Um, so at a post event, when you've had your event, you're thanking your volunteers, you make sure you, you're telling that story there. Thank you notes and cards and wrap up in e-newsletters and articles. And so I hope what I said resonated with you. I'm going to come off screen so we can do some Q&A, but I also wanted to let you know that this is my contact information. Guys, I have no idea about the time. So <laughs> Talene said that she would let me know, but I do also wanted to leave some time um, for Q&A um, with you. But this is my contact information. I also, um, if you go to my website, uh, www.supportingworldhope.com, like I said, I have a lot of no cost um, and low cost services. I do want to invite you to join and on my newsletter so you can get access to my VIP resource library because a lot of the things that I'm talking about here with storytelling is in there. How to uh, do your case for support, how to actually craft your story. And so storytelling makes a difference. I cannot stress that enough. And um, I see I already hit a button that was wrong. So with that, Hopefully my timing is good. Yes. You are perfect, Sabrina. So I'm thrilled. So Kavita, why don't you kick us off with your first question? And if you have, if you do have a question, feel free to raise your hand and I'll pull you on stage. Great. Thanks, Celine. Sabrina, thank you. That was amazing, energizing. Yes. I really want to go out and tell some stories. Thank good. you so much for this. Um, I work for a community foundation. So we, we've got a couple of programs, but mostly we don't have direct clients. Our our clients are our nonprofits in the mm -hmm. area who are amazing. Um, I'm new at my role in communications for this foundation, mm -hmm. and I don't know what's okay to tell stories about. Can I tell stories about my grantees' clients or am I stealing their stories? I mean, 
I was wondering I, if you had some advice for community foundations. Yeah, I would look at it kind of like, because um, I've worked with some United Ways before, and so I would see it in that way too. And so I would tell the stories from the perspective of um, the organizations, but not only the organizations, it would be how the, your funding, right, supports those organizations and how those organizations impact the lives of clients. So it's, it's a more of a general uh more of a broader story. Does okay. that make sense? Yeah. Um, I so I wouldn't necessarily you. I would not necessarily um, go and say tell boys and girls club client stories for the foundation, if that makes sense. But I would tell the story of that individual. But I would tell the story of the impact of that organization. Okay. That's what I would do. That would be my recommendation. Okay. Yeah. Cause so, it's, it's, it's more one organization versus one person. Right. Kind of. okay. Right. So substitute that for the one organization and how is that organization impacting your community? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Perfect. Um, Sabrina, we had another question from Lauren, and she just wanted to get just a little bit more detail from you on how you balance effective storytelling and just ethical practices, as well as how do you see storytelling as just donor centric or really community centric? I, I am a donor centric girl. I can start off there. I've had that discussion about donor centric, community centric. I am a donor centric girl. I, I, that is what I practice, um, making the donor the hero, making them the center of, of, the, of the story. Um, and so as that's that. And then as far as like ethical stories, that's why I really stress that it needs to be about a real person. It needs to be about a real person who is a client in your, in your program. Now, I, there's nothing wrong with using stock photos, um, but the story itself needs to be about a real client. And that's why it's so important to make sure you have a process in place to collect stories. Completely agree. Completely agree with you. Um, and then Sam had mentioned something in the chat and Sam, feel free to come off mute if you want to expand on this, but how would you, what would you say if you are telling a story to a group of donors and you don't get a, a really excited response, what would you do next? How would you take that as feedback? Well, I would say you told the wrong story to the wrong group. That's about really getting to know your, the donors and the people that you're speaking with and figuring out what resonates with them. Um, sometimes we can make assumptions. We might think, oh, I'm talking to, I saw Sam's coming there. I'm talking to a room full of men. So let me tell the story about this father and that's gonna resonate with them. And that may not be the case at all. And trust me, I've done the mistakes. I have done it. I have been the one where it's crickets in the room. It just meant that I did not prepare and find out more about that, that group of collective individuals in the room and, and do the homework, do, do a little bit of your homework. Um, I mean, we have civic groups, we have Rotary, we have Kiwanis, we have Lions. We just need to see what resonates with that particular group. And just because they are, let's say Rotary, um, people might assume, oh, they're all business people. So they wanna hear something that has like a business slant. That might not be the case. You have to, you know, I'm coming to you um, as a speaker. Is there anything that the particular the group might be passionate about? Um, any topics that you've seen that have resonated with others when they speak? All of that kind of stuff. And that's why you need to have a variety of stories. You can't keep, you can't pull out that same story every time because it's not going to work on everybody. I love I, that. Go ahead. I, um was doing one for Buffalo, Buffalo perinatal prenatal, mm -hmm. which is for mothers, mm -hmm. but they're adding an addition for fathers, which is called the Father Initiative of Buffalo, Nurturing Fathers Initiative. So when the ladies got up to tell their stories, it was applause. And when I got up to tell my story as a father, it wasn't 
didn't go over so well. That was yeah. kind of what happened. So I, so from what I'm taking, what you're saying, it may just be that um, they were there for mothers more than they were. Fathers. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't that it, it wasn't their been. cup of tea. <laughs> yeah. Thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sam, for that question. And Pamela, do you want to come off mute and ask your question? Sure. Um, I, I, my question, like when you collect uh, stories from staff members, um, what are some of the recommendations you have for collecting those? Um, some of the recommendations, we had a standard form that we did. Um, and I, if you ask me right now, I don't remember exactly all the questions, but it wasn't, we try not to, the one thing I'm going to say is try not to put too much burden on your staff. Try to get like three points, exactly what it is that you're going to need to tell that story. Um, and we made it a part of a weekly report that we did that way. Um, but it was from, I had a staff, I had a staff of like 30 something. So some of those stories were not great, but at least I had enough sample of material that I could go through and look and see. Um, and then if something hit me really like, oh, I wanna know more about this one, I would then set up something so I could like talk to that, that kid and get more of that story. And, and also, I love program opportunities to, to gather more stories. And I'll tell you this, and I know this, it is fundraising, but it's not. But I, I'll tell you this one. I really love this project. We had um, local artists come in and talk to kids. And then what they did was they learned their story. And we had the, we had the club staff nominate kids. Um, and then the artists talked to the kids. And then they created artwork based on that kid's story. And then we actually uh, did an art display and it had, you know, here's what the, here's about the artist, here's about the clip and here's the artwork that was, that was done. Those are the kind of things that I'm saying, like continually get the story out there, always out there. Awesome. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And Pam, I'll make sure I connect you with our team because we have some good storytelling prompts using yeah. Memory Fox to do that as well. So I'll make sure that I get that to you and connect you with Jack. Um, but to be respectful of everyone's time, we are at the top of the hour. So Sabrina, any parting words, anything you want to close us out with? And then I'll, I'll wrap up. I just want to say that storytelling is so important um, and that anything that you can do to gather those stories, to keep those stories out there, Keep doing that and it will make a difference in your fundraising efforts. And just remember that storytelling is the most impactful data that is out there. We are a culture that remembers stories. So keep telling your stories. And thank you, Sabrina, for giving us such rich information and just being so generous with your time and with your expertise. And Memory Facts, we just actually launched our integration with Canva, which is just helping you. And I know Sabrina is a huge Canva fan, but you can directly pull your Memory Facts content into Canva and build really beautiful pieces. I dropped in a link if you want to learn more about that. And if you want to connect with our team, we're happy to help you there. Um, but again, keep telling great stories, everyone. Thank you for joining and being with us here today. We have even more really wonderful webinars to come. And thank you again, Sabrina, and enjoy the rest of everyone's Wednesday. Thank you, guys. Y'all be blessed. Keep telling stories. Bye.